It all started for me with a terrible week. I was living in London, working as an actress, um, and I was going to auditions, actually, where my boyfriend would get a casting breakdown that said things like, this character's an architect, and um, he's quite deep-thinking, and he has these kinds of relationships with his friends, and this is what's happened in his past that's made him this way. And I would get casting breakdowns that said things like, 32 double D. Nothing more. Um, I turned up to one audition where I was um, sitting, practicing my lines, and it, it was an advert audition. And as I was about to go in, someone put their hand on my shoulder and said, by the way, we've decided to sex it up a bit, and now you're taking your top off. And it wasn't would you or could we discuss. And quite apart from the situation, in the back of my head was just this voice saying, but it's a wardrobe advert. <laughs> Why? It's a wardrobe advert. So I think I was in a place where I was starting to think about the kind of differences in the ways that men and women were treated. But for me, what really pushed me over the edge, what my tipping point, if you like, was just by pure coincidence, a really bad week. I was walking home one night, and it was quite late, and the traffic was at a sort of bit of a standstill. And as I walked past, someone shouted out of their car window, just something about my legs, a kind of off-the-cuff comment. And I ignored it and carried on, and then the guy in the next car, I thought he'd try to shout something a bit worse. And I put my head down and I shrugged it off and I went home, like you do. And a few nights later, I was on the way home quite late at night on the bus on the phone to my mum. And I thought the guy next to me just accidentally brushed me with his hand, so I'd moved away. And then as I kept talking to my mum, I realised he was actually groping his way up my legs and into my crotch. So I stood up and moved away. And because I was on the phone to my mum, I said out loud what was happening. I said, I'm on the bus, this guy's just groped me. And everybody on the bus heard, and everybody looked away. No one stepped in, no one tried to help, but even more than that, there was a real sense of, why are you bringing this up? A real sense of kind of disapproval at me for sort of saying anything, and it made me feel very embarrassed and kind of ashamed and guilty, and like perhaps I'd done something wrong, was I wearing the wrong thing, should I have been there? All the feelings that belonged with the guy groping women on the bus. And then a few days later, I was walking down the street, and there was a truck with some scaffolding being unloaded off the back of it. And as I walked past, within about a metre of them, one guy just turned to the other and said, look at the tits on that. Not her, just that. And again, it was the kind of shin, creepy normalisation of it that really got me, that we were there looking at each other a metre away, and there was no sense that this was embarrassing or weird or that I might say anything back. And at the end of this week, I kind of sat down, I was thinking about these things, and the thing that struck me about them actually wasn't any one of those incidents in itself. It was the fact that if they hadn't all happened in the same week, I never would have thought twice about any one of them, because it was normal, because I was so used to it. And it made me start to think back about similar incidents that had happened over the months and years, and it made me start to wonder why I'd never mentioned any of them to anyone, let alone complaining or reporting or, or trying to do anything. And I started thinking about this, and I started asking other women, older women, people of my age, people I'd just met, younger women, have you ever experienced anything like this? Not necessarily in the street, but perhaps at work or at university. And I thought that maybe a few people would have a story to tell me. I thought that, you know, every third or fourth woman I asked, perhaps, would say, oh yeah, this one thing happened to me once, or I once had a job where this happened. And it wasn't like that at all. What actually happened took me completely by surprise. It was every woman I spoke to. And it wasn't this one thing five years ago. It was, yeah, on my way to meet you just now, this happened. Most days, this happens. I spoke to a friend who worked in the city who said that in her office, if women were coming in to interview for new job positions, the men would print out their photographs from the application forms and hold them up across the room and rate them out of 10 before they came in. I spoke to someone else who said, yeah, my male colleagues go to a strip club at lunchtime and sometimes take clients there, so I miss out on those deals. And it was really amazing that many of the women I spoke to made a real point of saying to me, but until you asked me, I've never told anyone that. And so I thought there was something going on here. There was this kind of accumulation of stories that often only the victim themselves was aware of. So I started trying to speak up about it. I started trying to talk about sexism. And I came up against a complete brick wall. People said to me, no, sexism doesn't exist anymore. And the reason they gave was always the same. It was women are equal now more or less. Sometimes they'd add more or less. 
And I you know, didn't know a huge amount about this, but I saw very clearly there was a connection between this idea, women are equal now, therefore sexism doesn't exist, and the fact that, for that reason, if you try to talk about sexism, you were making a fuss about nothing. You needed to learn to take a compliment. You needed to get a sense of humour. You were a bit uptight. He probably didn't mean it like that. There's two sides to every story. And I started thinking perhaps they were right. I didn't know a huge amount about it. You know, Perhaps everything was fine, women were equal, and I was kind of making a fuss about nothing. So I looked into it, I looked into this idea that women are equal now. And I thought it sounded about right, to be honest. But the more I looked into it, I started in politics, and I found that only one in four, actually just under one in four of our MPs is female, that five members of our 22-strong cabinet are female, that the UK comes joint 57th in the world for political gender equality. And then I looked into the law, because I thought these are areas where people, it's not just about representation, but they're making decisions that affect the rest of us every day. So I looked into law, and I found that actually only uh, 7 out of 38 law justices of appeal and 18 out of 108 high court judges are women. But I thought, if I go back to those people who tell me women are equal, everything's fine with these figures, they'll say, yeah, OK, perhaps you know, men outnumber women in some areas, but there are other areas where women proliferate, so it all evens out. So I thought, OK, what's an area where you might stereotypically think people might suggest that women would outnumber men? And I looked into the arts. And I found it was reported in 2010 that at our National Gallery, out of 2,300 works of art, the collection contained paintings by just 10 women. That our Royal Opera House, it's been over 14 years since a female choreographer was commissioned to create a piece for the main stage. And that out of 573 listed statues around the UK commemorating people of interest and inspiration, only 15% of them are of women. And it continued everywhere I looked. I looked into science and found that our Royal Society, one of our most important scientific institutions, has never had a female president, and only 6% of the current fellowship are women, that women make up 50% of chemistry undergraduates, but only 6% of professors, that women only write one-fifth of front-page newspaper articles, and 84% of those articles are dominated by male subjects or experts, that women only directed 5% of the 250 major films of 2011, that only one in ten of our engineers is female, which is less than half the proportion of France or Spain, that women make up only one in five of our architects, but 63% of them report experiencing sexual harassment in the course of their career. And the statistics that really did it for me finally were the crime statistics, when I realised that there's a phone call to the police every minute about domestic violence, that every seven minutes a woman is raped, that in the course of a year in England and Wales alone, 400,000 women are sexually assaulted and 85,000 raped, and that a woman living in England or Wales has a one in four chance of becoming a victim of domestic violence and a one in five chance of being a victim of a sexual offence, and that worldwide, one in three women on the planet will be raped or beaten in her lifetime. So I felt the argument that women are equal now, more or less, and we shouldn't make a fuss about it, really didn't stand up to scrutiny. But I also felt like I couldn't solve the problem if people wouldn't acknowledge it existed, that there was a gap there between what was going on and what people thought was happening. So I wanted to share my story and my experience of hearing all these women's stories together, which for me was what it took to make me recognize the scale of the problem. I wanted other people to have that same experience. And I thought the easiest way to do that would be to create a website. So I started a really simple website, I called it the Everyday Sexism Project, and I asked people to share their stories. I didn't have any means of advertising it or any way of getting the word out or any kind of funding, so I put it on my own Facebook wall, and I hoped that perhaps 30 or 40 women would share their stories, and I'd have something to point to when that argument came up again. Actually, you know, this is something that's happening a lot. What happened instead really took me by surprise. Stories started to trickle in, and then the trickle became a river, and the river became a flood. We heard from a woman in the city who was told to sit on her boss's lap if she wanted her Christmas bonus, a woman working in a video store who found that every time she went up the ladder to get fresh stock from the storeroom, her boss would spank her, and when she came back down, he'd look down her top and say, you know why I hired you. We heard from a reverend in the Church of England who was constantly being asked if there was a man available to perform the wedding or the funeral service. We heard from a DJ who said that constant groping and harassment had made her come to dread the job that she'd once loved. We heard from a midwife who was sexually assaulted by a senior male colleague, from a man who was congratulated for babysitting his own children, from teenage girls who talked about the pressures that the world around them put on them and how it made them feel about their bodies and their worth. And stories started coming 
coming in as well from further afield, from around the world. We heard from a woman in Argentina who tried to ignore the four men catcalling her, only to find that they screeched to a halt and tried to drag her into their car. From 12 and 16-year-old sisters who were trying to picnic in a public park in France when a man came and exposed himself to them. A woman in Mexico who was told by her university professor in a lecture, Caedita te ves más bonita, you look prettier when you shut up. We heard from a woman in India who was too afraid to report the man with the erection pressed into her back on the train. And so very quickly, we started to expand the project and set up new branches of it and sent out those branches to women around the world to use within local communities. And suddenly, we had tens of thousands of entries coming in. And to date, the project, which has been running for just under three years, has collected 90,000 testimonies from people all over the world. And some things have arisen from this kind of grassroots project because it's sort of the first of its kind on this scale. And we've been able to pull out some really interesting kind of facts and ideas and themes. And really, they're all themes of connection. The first is the connection between the different kinds of project entry. Because people often want to tell you, you know, you can be upset about these issues, um, but these issues are not that big a deal, don't make a fuss about them. So it's okay to talk about rape and domestic violence, but you're often shrugged off if you try to mention street harassment. It's okay to talk about the underrepresentation of women in politics and business, but it's not really that big a deal. You're just getting your knickers in a twist if you bring up media sexism. But what the entries made so clear was that the same words and phrases that were being hurled at women in the street who were told it's just a bit of street harassment, don't make a fuss, were being used to a victim of domestic abuse behind closed doors. A woman who tried to ignore an incident that was just street harassment found that it escalated, that the man followed her home and sexually assaulted her on her doorstep. It was evident that it wasn't possible to tackle something like the underrepresentation of women in the media if we didn't also look at the sexist portrayal of female politicians and the knock-on impact that that had. And that so clearly, by creating these normalized, accepted attitudes and behaviors towards women at a low level, we were sort of opening the door to the fertile ground from which the more serious issues were able to spring. The second kind of connection that came very clear from the entries was that we weren't just hearing from women who were experiencing sexism. We were hearing from women who were experiencing multiple forms of prejudice that were combined and intermingled with sexism. We heard from disabled women who described being asked to do a pole dance around their walking stick or sitting in their wheelchair to have someone shout at them, if you're just going to sit there, you might as well get your tits out. We heard from a black woman who was told in a job interview by the guy interviewing her that he had fantasies of sleeping with exotic black women. From an Asian woman who was walking down the street with her boyfriend and someone shouted and asked if she was a male order bride. From trans women who were hounded and harassed in public spaces. Women who were out with their girlfriends and found that men followed them down the street saying they had something that would turn them straight or asking if they could watch or join in. Older women who again and again and again used the word invisible in their project entries. And again, it became clear that these weren't things that could be neatly compartmentalized into different types of experience, but they were cumulative, they impacted together in complex ways and in multi-layered ways, and that they came from the same root of being other from what was considered the norm, the default norm, and that, that wasn't just a male norm, but actually a white male norm, a white, non-disabled, cisgendered, heterosexual norm, and so on. And the third kind of connection that became clear from the entries was that we were hearing similar things from what men were saying and what women were saying. We had project entries coming in, for example, from a man who was turned down when he asked for parental leave in the office, and not just denied it, but actually ridiculed for asking. And from a woman who was denied a promotion on the grounds that she was a maternity risk. Clearly, those weren't two people sort of saying different things. Those were two sides of the same coin, people suffering the negative effects of the same outdated gender stereotype. And it quickly became clear that these things were having a big negative impact on men as well, that not every woman was suffering them, and that not for a moment was every man perpetrating them. It was never about vilifying men or suggesting that every man is sexist. It was really about saying that we needed to stand up to this together. It wasn't about men against women. It was about people standing up to prejudice. And in fact, it wasn't even always about individual men or about men at all. Often it was structural. People were writing in, describing things that weren't necessarily an individual experience, but more a wider comment on the things that they saw around them in society. And often it was the really minor things, the things that we might just flick by without even noticing, like three headlines about business leaders in the same paper, and then another headline that was very similar in the same paper, but somehow slightly different. Sometimes it was something that you couldn't even quite put your finger on. 
Sometimes it was something about the fact that we see female bodies all around us every day, we're so used to them, but actually it's really just one female body that we're seeing again and again, an incredibly narrow media stereotype of what it means to be a woman, to be a young, thin, large-breasted, often long, long-haired, long-legged white woman, and how that was impacting on women. The ideas and the impact it was having that people were seeing pieces of women's bodies all around them every day, often being used to sell completely unrelated products from a burger to a betting website. The fact that when people saw women in the public eye, regardless of the reason why they were in the public eye, what was being asked wasn't what they'd done or what they were there for, but whether or not you'd want to sleep with them, whether they were somebody who'd been accused of a crime, somebody who'd been the victim of a crime, or even a politician. And what became really clear as well from the things that started coming in was that not everybody wanted to tell a story. Some people wanted to stop other people from telling theirs. And some of the responses that started coming in, this is what happened the first time that I talked about the project on the radio. This is what happened the first time I gave a speech about politics. And these kinds of messages started coming in actually from within about two weeks of my starting the project, which is really interesting because at that point it hadn't received any major interest, we hadn't got a huge amount of interest, we certainly hadn't got any kind of national papers reporting on it, and yet for some people the idea of even talking about these things was so terrifying that they felt that they had to react by shutting it down. And ironically, of course, in the process, really proving why it was so needed. There's nothing more ironic and kind of funny than receiving a message, as I did the other day, that says something like, um, sexism doesn't exist, you stupid bitch. <laughs> but I'm not here, as Matt said, to depress you, because there is also good news. Since we started the project and since we collected about 50,000 entries, suddenly we started being able to take them offline and using them to create change in ways that would hopefully prevent these things from happening again we started being able to take the entries that we got from women in the workplace to MPs when they were looking at ways to tackle the gender pay gap. We started taking the stories that we got from children into schools and using them to start conversations about healthy relationships and sexual consent. We took the stories we got from women on public transport to the British Transport Police and they used them as part of an initiative to retrain 2,000 of their officers in a project that's reported, resulted in the increase of reporting of sexual offences on public transport by 35%. And we also started getting a different kind of story coming in. We were still getting the stories of women experiencing sexism and harassment and discrimination, but we were also hearing from women who said things like, I'm a single mum, uh, sick of cold callers ringing and asking to speak to the man of the house, so now I put them on to my six-year-old son. He sings them, I'm sexy and I know it. Or well, the woman who said that she was on the train when she asked a man to move his bag so she could sit down, and he said, why don't you grab my cock? So she said to the whole carriage, I'm so sorry I didn't bring my tweezers. <laughs> or the woman who was walking down the street and said men liked to shout at her and tell her that she had big breasts, and she took to looking down at them and screaming like she'd never seen them before. <laughs> People are finding their own individual ways of standing up, and it's something that each of us will have the opportunity to do at some point. These things will cross each of our paths, and often it doesn't have to be waving a banner or going on a march. It can be using your own very individual way of standing up and pointing it out. And I will leave you with this example of a tweet that was sent out by a sports-related Twitter account before a match one day, asking for girls to get their tits out for the lads, and just a few of the responses that women came up with on Twitter. The first person sent them a pair of tits. The next person, a pair of jugs. Someone sent them some lovely bats. Someone sent them a big rack. Then they were sent a lovely muff, a pair of bazookas, and finally, a cute little ass. Thank you.